Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Mireya Solis. I'm the director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies here at Brookings. And it's my great pleasure to be moderating this second session that looks at the uh, external environment and China's international uh, economic challenges, or more broadly, all sorts of international challenges. So we have a very distinguished uh, group of speakers uh, today, and I'm going to introduce them very briefly and then uh, mention the topics that they'll be covering. After their opening statements, I'm going to ask them a few questions, and then I'm going to open it up so we can have a back and forth uh, with all of you. So we're going to start with uh, Huang Yiping, who is a professor and deputy dean at Peking University, and who will discuss financial reform in China. Then uh, we'll move to uh, Peter Petri, who is a non-resident senior fellow here at the John Gordon <coughs> China Center. And then Eswar Prasad, who is a senior fellow at the Global Economy and Development Program here at Brookings. So there's a lot of, to cover, and I will not engage in a very lengthy introduction. I want to give the speakers a chance to go ahead and jump in. Professor Wang. Okay. Um, so you just heard a relatively cautiously optimistic outlook from my colleagues in the previous session. And one issue I um, touched upon um, is how the finance works in supporting that kind of rise of the Chinese economy. This is a particularly a big issue at the moment um, for whoever is follows um, the development of policies in China, you would know we have a bigger problem at the moment, two problems. Number one, finance is not supporting the real economy. We're having problems that SMEs financing is not sufficiently uh, uh, provided, and even the households had uh, difficulties in finding enough ways of investing their money. Um, so this is one big issue. How do we channel uh, the money from the financial institutions to the real economy to support the growth? That's one issue we're facing. The other issue we're facing is it looks like financial risk is becoming more prominent. So even the government officials and repeatedly say we should try to control the financial risks and avert um, any potential financial crisis. So this, I think, is a one big assumption we have to make and look the challenge we have to look into in order for the um, somewhat more upbeat scenarios my colleagues uh, um, uh, uh, painted for you that really played out. <clears throat> for the financial sector itself, uh, we had 40 years of financial reform, but the starting point was just the one financial institution, the People's Bank of China, which accounted for 93% of the total financial assets in the country in 1978. 40 years later, you look at the financial system, it's number one, gigantic. Number two, um, very weak regulation. And number three, the government still does a lot in intervening in the financial system. Interest rate, exchange rate, credit allocation, cross-border capital flows, and so on. So these are just the key features of the financial system we have today. Uh, as an economist, when I look at it, my first uh, reaction is, well, this is not good, because we're moving to a free market, but still lots of government interventions. But the other thing you immediately will think of about is, well, this system might be problematic, but it didn't stop the Chinese economy from growing by almost, well, more than 9% a year for four decades. And we didn't experience any major financial crisis, so let me ask you, if you don't like this financial system, what else you like or you prefer better? Um, so that's one thing, and we had an analysis in the, in the book saying, well, number one, some of the policy distortions are actually transitional phenomena because we are moving from a central planned system to a free market. It's a gradual approach, so there are some policy restrictions and distortions that remain for quite a while over time, but that gradually they have to face out, to be phased out. The second thing actually is because you, we have a phenomenon what we call market failure. The free market is the best only if the free market mechanism works the best. And my colleague, uh, Professor Xu Jingtao, described about the environmental policy, climate change, and so on. That's one particular area 
where free market itself would not be sufficient to solve all the problems. That's why you need the government to take actions to overcome the market failure. In the financial industry, it's the same. If you just liberalize and you think the market would work perfectly, and normally it doesn't. That's why many developing countries liberalize the capital account and they immediately suffer from a financial crisis. In the case of China, my take was during the last 40 years, it worked. Mainly because, well, yes, we had some, suffered some efficiency losses because of the government in, uh, intervention. But it worked because if the market mechanism is not well developed, it still was very effective. And I can assure you, converting saving into investment could be done overnight. With some efficiency losses, it was very effective in supporting growth. That, I think, was the key reason why we didn't really like the way the financial system was operating, but it was very effective. However, we're having a bigger problem today. The main reason why we're having a bigger problem today is because we're entering into a new phase of development. The job for finance becomes different. In the past, what you did was basically channeling saving into investment and supporting extensive growth of low end manufacturing. So the key driving force was low cost of, of, of in the economy. Now the cost is rising. Um, the World Bank used to describe it as the middle income trap. We needed to innovate. Most of the innovation is done by the private enterprises, and they're small. That's why when the banks face these private, small private enterprises, well, who are the driving force of innovation, the banks didn't know what to do. Because the banks usually would have to rely on historical data, fixed assets, or even government implicit guarantee in order to make a lending decision. The SMEs don't have any of these. And that's why when the banks, the banks are finding it very difficult to deal with them. So this is why we are having a lot of changes in the Chinese economy. I'm not going to get into it, but there are two things that is happening at the moment. One is market-oriented reform. We need to treat the, um, the, 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 um, the, the SMEs, the private enterprises, as equally as the SOEs and many other companies. But we also need to be innovative in terms of risk assessment. So for instance, the new fintech companies in China, they're doing brilliant jobs. The My Bank of and Financial, the We Bank of Tencent, and there's an, another XW Bank in Chengdu. All, all three online banks are extending more than 10 million SME or individual loans every year. That never happened, I, I could not even imagine. Like for any of the big banks who would be able to do this. And they do it based on big data analysis, based on machine learning approach. They don't even see the people, but they're extending all these loans and control the risk, the risk is pretty well. The average NPL ratio is around 1%. So I think they found something that is unique but effective. And now what is happening now is, as you can imagine, all the banks actually trying to, to emulate what the fintech company um, is doing at the moment. So that's one very important part of the story. The other part of the story is push ahead with a further, further with market-oriented reform. Interest rate liberalization, liberalization of the banks, and so on. There, um, one very important part of the story which I want to share with you, and, and that will conclude my opening remark, but that would also, also bridge uh, what uh, um, uh, Peter and, uh, and Ashwa would discuss, financial opening. Financial opening would be a very important step moving ahead, not just improving the, the, uh, improving the, the investment efficiency, but also help to improve the quality of domestic financial institutions so that we can do better jobs. Importing capital is probably only a secondary consideration. And more or less, now you look at the Chinese actually investing more overseas um, than the money is coming in. But in terms of opening up, there are two areas we're looking at. The last couple of years, this is actually accelerating. The first area is opening of the financial service industry. The policymakers take a relatively more aggressive approach because that would have less 
implications for financial stability, inviting foreign financial institutions to come to China to operate. It's a little bit like a direct investment into the Chinese financial industry. So you probably heard uh, we already have a lot of uh, foreign banks in China. But recently, um, the Nomura and the JP Morgan are getting their um, securities licenses. PayPal is getting into China in the payment industry. Even American Express is also um, trying to get something in China. So that is a one area the government is accelerating, opening up. There will be a lot more foreign institutions into, into China. I think that is very good because foreign institutions coming into China, number one, increased competition, therefore would, be, would add pressure on the domestic uh, institutions. Number one, they would also bring some more advanced uh, models and uh, technologies in terms of business. And that would also be beneficial for the domestic uh, financial services. One thing p domestic people often worry is, well, when foreign institutions come, will that hurt our financial stability? My own sense is not. Because whether or not you will maintain financial stability, it's up to the quality of financial, your financial regulation. It's a little bit like the story we heard about Vietnam um, pollution. I think we should work together to improve the quality of um, the environment. But at the end of the day, whether or not you have a lot more coal burning uh, power genera generators, depending on what policies, environmental standards you maintain. So that's something we need to look at very closely. The second thing is about opening up the financial market. And we're also seeing lots of changes there. So for instance, the Chinese debt market is already into the indexes of Bloomberg, Barclay, Global Index, uh, JP Morgan, EM Index. Standard Poor is also in China doing the ratings also. So I think these openings would be very useful. Um, and help improve the quality of the Chinese financial institution. But at, at the same time, obviously, we need to be careful about the potential implications for financial risks. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Huang. Next, we're going to hear from Professor Petri, who will discuss technology cooperation and competition between the United States and China. Yes, I, uh, thank you. Um, I, I want to make clear that our book really has two chapters on technology. One, one chapter, which is looking at the domestic uh, policy uh, framework with which technology development can be stimulated, and the other, which is the one that I will talk about, which is mm -hmm. the international mm -hmm. context. Um, in this international context, obviously, technology is a critical kind of core economic issue, and it's not going away. Uh, in that sense, I think it's very good that we have a very long time horizon, this 2049 time horizon, because it allows us to look more carefully at the fundamental issues uh, about technology and about the relationship between the two countries uh, that present uh, very challenging problems. It's not going away because the two countries are emerging as the dominant leaders of technology, at least for the foreseeable future. The United States is ahead now. It probably will be generally ahead for much of this period. But China is, is developing its capacity very, very fast. And in some areas, it already has global leadership. So this is, this is obviously going to be a, an ever tighter uh, uh, competition. Uh, and there are large consequences to it, uh, large consequences, obviously, from the viewpoint of national security, also from the viewpoint of rents that you can earn in new large ind global industries, and finally, from the viewpoint of growth itself, because the other drivers of growth are diminishing uh, beside innovation. So we both, both countries emphasize innovation as critical drivers of growth. Um, so technologic com uh, technological competition is inevitable, but so is, at some level, uh, technological cooperation. Uh, it's fundamental to how scientists and engineers work. Uh, it's fundamental to how industries develop, and it's going to be part of this long picture if you look at how technology develops. And so I, I really find this decoupling uh, story to be a very poor metaphor for thinking about what is going to have to happen mm -hmm. in the next uh, 30 years. It's not just competition or just cooperation. It's not just defensive 
or uh, collaborative approaches to technology. It's the mix in almost all industries. It varies a lot by sector, and it varies a lot over time. And I hope it will vary a lot over time because we are at kind of a low point uh, in thinking about technology uh, today. Uh, the second point that I want to make is technolo uh, technological interdependence is very, very hard to manage, and we're learning a lot about that uh, just over the last couple of years uh, about efforts to try to separate uh, some uh, uh, parts of the technology sector between the two countries. Companies are very good at working around uh, technologies that they are prohibited from getting or markets that they are uh, prohibited from serving. Uh, in addition, uh, the world is a very complicated large place, and they have access to companies that uh, have technology that can fill in for those that are denied to them, and they have ways of entering markets uh, that might be under pressure to not, uh, not be open to them. So companies are very good at both getting the technology, designing the technology, and getting access. Uh, Third, standards in a world which is very large and uh, served by many different uh, producers, standards in that kind of world are inevitably international. And Chinese companies have been very good so far uh, at uh, making their impact on, on global standards. Congress just passed uh, actually requirements for the United States to become more active in part to respond uh, to uh, China's, uh, China's work on, on, on global standards. Um, controls are very hard to implement. Uh, we know that from the U.S. efforts to develop a new set of export controls, they, have, they are now about a year late, and it looks like from the latest news there will be another year and a half before they are implemented, and in that process they're narrowing back to the format, as, as best as we can tell from the discussion that is going on, narrowing back to the format of really kind of focusing on critical areas of technology that have to be defended. The last point is uh, in, in this area is that decoupling is also likely to be very, very expensive if taken to its extreme. Uh, I just read this in The Economist. I don't know how true it is, but they put a, a price tag of $2 trillion on trying to separate the hardware interdependence between the United States and China today. So the third point, and that's my, my last point, is given the importance of the issue, given the <coughs> difficulty of managing it, I see the key policy issue from the viewpoint of China, as well as the United States, really, over this next decade or two, managing uh, this mix, complicated mix, of competition and cooperation in technology. What does that mean? Well, well part of it is, is building some of the frameworks uh, that help management to, to work. What do I mean by that? First, uh, it, it means having a risk management mindset to dealing with technology issues. It means not having kind of absolutist viewpoints of, of what we can or cannot transfer, but really trying to understand what it costs to put barriers in place and what are the most effective barriers that can be uh, put in place. The second is to build a set of international guardrails uh, that, that, that can be used, that are clear, that are understood, and that countries can enforce uh, in, in implementing their technology policies. Uh, these might be uh, rules about intellectual property, about cyber theft, about export and investment controls. The set of controls we now have, but which we have more or less abandoned in, 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 uh, in at least this kind of initial contentious phase of the technology uh, uh, discovery of, of technology competition, and which we need to rebuild so that they are uh, clear and they are practically <coughs> manageable by, by both governments. Last point is, and this is the hardest point, is that we need to kind of go back to the fundamentals which make such a regime work well. Uh, that is, ultimately, there's no other way to put it. I understand that it sounds a bit mushy, but it's rebuilding uh, trust. Uh, that means creating greater transparency uh, uh, about the policies that countries use uh, to implement technology. Uh, developing new institutions, uh, collaborative checking of, of uh, sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, technologies, and so on. Um, maybe in China, and this is kind of a big question, maybe in China drawing a kind of 
wider, clearer distinction between military and state technologies and private commercial technologies uh, that may make it easier for, for American and, and international partners to join them. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I will hear from Ezra Prasad, who will discuss the internationalization of the RMB. And more. <laughs> what impact will China have on global finance? There are two aspects to that. One is what Mireya referred to what role the renminbi plays in global financial markets and the second is what china's capital both the capital coming in and coming out <laughs> will play in terms of what happens with china's role in international financial markets let's start with the renminbi over the last 10 years the renminbi has followed a very interesting arc 2010 is where china seemed more committed to greater opening up of the capital account and into this notion of creating a currency that would match China's stature on the international stage. For five years, that project worked remarkably well. The renminbi started gaining traction in international finance as a payments currency, even as a reserve currency. And then in 2015, things changed. The renminbi's progress as an international currency stalled. China's renminbi has continued making progress in some respects, but the shine seems to have come off. So what happens in the horizon we are looking at till 2049? As with most good questions in economics, the answer is, it depends. It's going hmm. to depend to a very large extent on what China does, starting with what Professor Huang talked about, whether it gets finance right. If you think about what really makes a difference to a currency's prominence in international finance, it's about the ability of its domestic financial markets to support that currency's role. So if you think about the renminbi's role as an international payments currency, certainly China's sheer size, China's dominance um, in international trading is going to mean that the renminbi could, if the government wanted it to do so, play a greater role in international payments. And China's government does seem to be taking steps in that direction. You do have an electronic payment system that is now much more effective in terms of getting plugged into international payment systems, <coughs> the CPIS, the China Payment uh, uh, International System. Um, you have other measures being taken within China itself to improve the stability of the payment system. China now has currency pacts with many other countries that allow bilateral um, trading between their currencies. There are such pacts with Russia, with Korea, with Japan and a host of other countries which make it easier for trades between these two countries to be settled in their own currencies rather than going through a vehicle currency such as the dollar. Interestingly, China does not meet many of the prerequisites of the traditional prerequisites of a reserve currency economy. China does not have a fully open capital account. China does not have a fully open uh, market uh, determined exchange rate. In fact, it seems like the world wants China to have a market-determined exchange rate every time the markets want to push the renminbi up. That is for an appreciation. And every time China's renminbi starts depreciating, everybody says, forget the whole thing. Let's have China intervene in uh, markets and not let the renminbi depreciate too much. You hear the same message from Washington. And in fact, Beijing also seems much more comfortable with managing the renminbi on the way up rather than on the way down. Um, to have a reserve currency, there is a prominent one. You need a number of prerequisites in addition to the ones um, that I mentioned. What is striking, of course, is that the renminbi has already become, both in de jure terms and de facto terms, an important international reserve currency. Right now, according to the latest IMF figures, the renminbi accounts for about 2% of global FX reserves. Now, accounting for 2% of global foreign exchange reserves might not seem like a great deal. Accounting for 2% of global payments might not seem like a great deal. But one must remember that China started from basically zero uh, just a few years ago. And China still is a developing economy which is competing on a world stage against other major currencies. So I think what is likely to happen if China plays its cards right in terms of improving its financial markets, in terms of opening up its capital account and um, creating a more market-determined exchange rate is that the Chinese renminbi will become a more important international payments currency. It is likely to become 
a somewhat more important reserve currency. Although, is it really going to challenge the dollar or the other dominant um, uh, reserve currencies out there? There, I have a reservation. And in fact, it's a reservation where uh, my Chinese colleagues and I have a slight difference of points of view, uh, which always makes things a little interesting. Um, their view, which is a legitimate one, and this is an empirical one that is going to be tested by 2049, is that the rule of law is very important, but how you define the rule of law is where the difference comes. Ch the Chinese notion of the rule of law is that you have um, the rule of law such that market rights and contractual and property rights are, um, uh, are dealt with very effectively. This is what is needed for a market economy to work well. This is what the Chinese government um, recognizes and the legal reforms are working towards that. My view is different, subtly different, but in what very important way, which is that I think what is necessary is for foreign investors to trust that the rule of law will be such that even the government has to be subservient to the rule of law. This is not what the Chinese government has in mind. This is what I have in mind. And I think it makes a difference. If you look at reserve currency economies around the world, not only do they have strong policies, open markets, flexible exchange rates, but in addition, they have what I would consider the rule of law where even the governments are subject to the same set of rules that everybody else has to play by. Certainly, those rules can be changed by the government, but not in an ad hoc manner. And this, I think, is really important in terms of maintaining the trust <coughs> of international foreign investors. And I think this is what is going to prevent the RMB from becoming a safe haven currency. Um, so, at some level, what trajectory the RMB uh, has through 2049 is going to depend to a very large extent on policies that ultimately are going to be very important for China itself. So, whether or not the RMB becomes a dominant currency, China needs to do the right thing. And in fact, this is the very notion that I think pushed many reformers in the Chinese government to take the position that it might be good to think about the RMB playing a major role in international finance. Because in order to do that, you needed to do a lot of things domestically, which ultimately would be good for China, irrespective of what happened with the RMB. <coughs> this again goes back um, to where Professor Huang started out domestic financial market reform, but in addition, institutional reform as well, uh, including better corporate governance, uh, a more effective, even if circumscribed, uh, rule of law and so on. So I think the RMB is on its way to becoming a, an important payments currency, a more important reserve currency than it is right now, but on its uh, present trajectory, highly unlikely to be a safe haven currency. What about China's broader impact on financial markets? As Professor Huang has pointed out, money can now go into China much more easily into equity markets, into bond markets. So China is going to have an impact in terms of where money can go. But what I think is going to be far more important, and this is where I'll conclude, is the impact that China could have in terms of international financial markets through money going out of China. One very important change that we've already started seeing is that the major source of capital outflow is no longer um, foreign exchange reserve accumulation by the central bank, which one can think about as official flows. <clears throat> Over the last decade, what China's government has been trying actively to do is to make it easier to take money out of China as well. Now, you've heard a lot about capital flight associated with the anti-corruption drive. You've heard about capital flight associated with fears that the renminbi is on the way down. But I think this all happened, unfortunately, at a time when China was doing the right thing with the right intentions, which is giving domestic investors the ability to invest abroad in order to get better returns, in order to get portfolio diversification, and to provide competition for the domestic financial system in order to get it to kick up uh, um, uh, its own gear by a few notches. Um, the amount of money locked into China, um, especially if you think about the banking system, is enormous. Um, banking uh, deposits in China account for about 165-170% of GDP, about half of which is household deposits. So that adds up to about um, $10 trillion. Uh, if you think about 
10% of that coming out for the right reasons, for diversification reasons, that's about a trillion, trillion and a half dollars worth of money coming out. And I think this is where China is really going to have an uh, important impact. So it's not just the debt accumulation of other countries through the Belt and Road Initiative, which is politically a sensitive issue and what you hear about. But I think the, the retail uh, investor presence, both um, household and corporate, and what effect it has on global equity and uh, fixed income markets is, I think, going to be the really interesting thing to watch. And here again, the way it plays out is going to a large extent depend on how China itself plays its cards in terms of domestic financial market development and what sort of channels it creates for money to flow in and out of China. So the only thing I can say about uh, um, what's going to happen through 2049 with any certainty is that it's going to be a heck of an interesting ride. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. Really insightful. Uh, uh, presentations and I would like to take the opportunity to ask each one of you um, a question and I want to start with this notion as to whether China can get finance right or not and I'm coming here uh, from a comparison that I'm making with Japan <coughs> even though of course the economic models between Japan and China are very different you <coughs> can make the case that once upon a time Japan was a fast-growing economy mm. that mm. almost looked unstoppable <coughs> And after the bubble collapsed, uh, Japan was saddled with a decade-long non-banking, a non-performing loan uh, crisis in the banking sector, and that been, meant that Japan transitioned to a slow growth, deflation, and uh, uh, was largely eclipsed from its previous uh, uh, trajectory. Is something like that in the cards for China from the from here to 2049? What are the chances of that? What can China do differently? Well, um, my first observation is that I will feel very happy if we can once reach Japan's development level, relying on our current financial system. I think it will be brilliant if we can be a very advanced uh, um, economy. So uh, Japan might look like a bad story for you, uh, but it's not so bad for us um, if we can rise in that way. But I do agree there are things that we should try to avoid. And one thing that is very similar, this is why, for instance, give you an example. Um, we're all talking about a very high leverage in China, and the people are so worried that the high leverage ratios in China could immediately lead to the so-called imminent Minsky moment, which means the collapse of the debt market. I actually think otherwise, because you look at the high leverages, um, they actually concentrate in two areas. One is the SOE, and the other are the local government uh, investment vehicles. Both of them are related one or uh, the other to the central, bank, central government, uh, the fiscal uh, uh, budget which really means imminent collapse is very unlikely. But the worst case scenario is like what happened in Japan, when um, the debt continued to accumulate, the efficiency decline, eventually we might drive the investment returns to zero, which means at the end of the day, we might see a period of stagnation. That's something we're trying to avoid. So restructuring of the financial sector, the government is even talking about the SOE reform and so on. I think that is a fundamental. The most important challenge facing us, I think, is the SOE reform. So for instance, we all worry about the misallocation of credit in China, and we blame the big banks. They, like, they love the SOEs, they don't like the private sector. But I've, fo I've been focusing on uh, research in this area, and after a while I realized actually the bank managers are doing a good job in managing their risks. If you're a bank manager, you, you're allocating credit. Whom should you allocate most of your credit to? The SOEs. Even as an economist, if I'm appointed to a job in a, in a bank, I will do the same. The, the reason is not because I prefer SOE over private sector, but because the SOE's risks are just low. If I extend the money, if it fails, they still have ways to work out and the money will still come back. If I extend the money to the private sector, if it fails, the money disappears. So another example is I just told you earlier, Standard Poor now is also in China rating the Chinese debt. I actually observed that their ratings are in very similar pattern. They favor SOEs. 
So uh, we thought, well, we introduced four international standard rating agencies that will help improve the quality of our debt market, but their rating patterns are very same, it, it, almost the same as our uh, big com bigger banks' the credit allocation, which really tells us the root problem is not in the financial industry, but in the so-called we need to achieve so-called competitive neutrality, really treat these two two kinds of enterprises the same. And then we will see the deleveraging in the SOEs and the large part of the economy credit can be allocated more efficiently. So if there is a one, there must be lots of things we need to do to avoid the Japan scenario. But the most important challenge we're facing now is how to reform the SOEs. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Petri, um, I agree with you that decoupling, whole-scale decoupling, would be extremely expensive. And I actually don't think that there is a political appetite in this country to really go forward uh, with it. So if it's really going to be a more nuanced uh, pattern of collaboration and competition in the technology sector, I wonder if you could give us some examples of where you think that the zero-sum dynamics would dominate, where you think it will be more positive uh, sum. And then you also alluded to international safeguards and the need for rules, say, on intellectual property. Uh, but being a trade expert, I can only uh, uh, then uh, think about the very worrisome condition of the World Trade Organization and the difficulty in generating uh, such rules. And even though we have not yet seen the text of the phase one US-China trade deal, it seems it will not deliver a lot on uh, the structural issues and intellectual property. So. Uh, what is the hope, really, uh, from here to 2049, that we can actually get those international safeguards in place? Well, first of all, between here and 2049 is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, to some extent, working in our advantage because we're caught up now in the middle of a, of a, a period when we're discovering the problem but don't yet have uh, solutions uh, for it. In terms of, of uh, you know, first looking at the issue of, of where... Uh, uh, there is a possibility of, of kind of leaning more on the cooperation side rather than on the defensive protection of technology side. I sort of think of areas like biotechnology, of uh, uh, environment-related uh, engineering areas, uh, and even of communications uh, with appropriate safeguards for, for, for national security. So all of those are areas where there isn't a kind of direct link to the very contentious national security uh, issues that there might be in some other areas. And I, I, I would think that one can design uh, a set of, uh, set of controls that make guardrails, as, as I like to think of them, uh, that sort of keep uh, competition and cooperation within uh, reasonable areas. Now, the, the question of how you get there is, is troubling, because many of these issues are of concern not just to the United States or China, but also, obviously, to Europe and, and, and uh, everybody who uses modern technology. And we don't have a mechanism for dealing with them. And the W2 is struggling at kind of a much lower level before getting to these really hard issues about, about technology. So I think the question is, is, how do you get there? You know, here, um, given some time, I think the, the, the China, Europe, United States <coughs> triangle is, is to me a very promising, uh, you know, a very promising avenue for moving. Um, you know, how that happens, when it happens, I'm, I'm not sure. But I think we all have a large, uh, large interest in making it happen. Thank you very much. And my last question uh, to Eswar. Uh, you mentioned in passing uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And I wonder if you could expand on it a little bit in the sense that one of the goals, I imagine, of this initiative is to increase the economic uh, interconnection between China and all the recipient uh, countries. And therefore, you could think that this could also be seen as a good strategy to encourage the use of the Air, um, Air AMB. Uh, what, what do you think this uh, uh, will add to? The Belt and Road Initiative is a complex uh, matter. It's complex both economically and uh, geopolitically, both from the perspective of China and um, the other countries involved. At some level, one might argue that the uh, motives behind BRI are very good ones, that is creating 
um, better um, connections through infrastructure, through um, uh, transfer of uh, resources across countries, but it's not quite uh, played out that way. First of all, the amount of resources that China has um, put behind the project, um, the, we saw large numbers to begin with, but those have gotten scaled back over time. The ambitions of the BRI seem to have been scaled back uh, uh, somewhat. And I think there has been some concern, uh, both among the countries involved and the countries on the periphery, including India, who chose not to get involved, that um, this may be more about China's geopolitical ambitions rather than um, really creating uh, economic connections. Um, so there's been some degree of reappraisal of the BRA, but um, to answer your specific question about whether the BRA might have a role, um, uh, or was it seen as having a role in terms of promoting uh, the RMB, there were some discussions about that early on, but I think these two have proceeded on um, uh, separate tracks. Um, uh, my sense is that China has not uh, tried to act with a heavy hand in terms of trying to uh, use um, money that is given to countries uh, for BRI, BRI projects um, to use um, uh, the RMB in any way. There have been a couple of uh, instances uh, where the two have been linked, but I don't think there is any concerted effort uh, to link the two. Great. So let's open it to the public. If you can please uh, raise your hand, there will be a mic coming, and if you can please uh, identify yourself and ask a very concise uh, question. We'll start here with uh, Mr. Bergsten. Just wait, please, for the mic. Fred Bergsted again. Uh, question for Eswar. Uh, you advocated, and it sounds like you expect over this period, that China will substantially liberalize the controls on capital outflows. Do you expect that to lead to a big depreciation of the exchange rate of the RMB? As you well know, that's what happened when <coughs> Japan did in 1980. <coughs> At that time, it coexisted with Reaganomics and U.S. fiscal monetary mix that pushed the dollar up also, but the result was a massive exchange rate disequilibrium between yen and dollar. Could the same thing happen if China moves in that direction? And parenthetically, what did you all, going back to the first panel, what did you all assume about the exchange rate in 2049? when you were uh, calculating your GDP numbers for China. So Fred, it depends. Uh, <laughs> but actually, before I start, I should say that Fred was very generous in talking about our book. Fred has an excellent book coming out on the um, uh, China-US uh, relationship and what, how it might play out on the world stage. So when it comes out, whenever it does, I urge you to look at that. Um, what we economists know about exchange rates is very limited. The one thing we can say with reasonable certainty, as you well know, Fred, is that over the long term, by which I mean horizons of about 10 years or longer, and the 2049 horizon fits well into this, is that ultimately it is productivity differentials that matter for real exchange rates, that is exchange rates uh, uh, adjusting for price differences across countries. China has generated remarkable productivity growth in the last two or three decades that is slowing very fast. So a lot of what my colleagues uh, um, um, and fellow uh, authors spoke about is really going to be important for this, uh, for the answer to your question. If China gets finance right, if it gets uh, demographic and other policies right and can generate good productivity growth, then over the long term, China's currency is going to appreciate relative to the US, which has been uh, registering relatively low productivity growth. But for horizons that matter to, um, to us, uh, to financial markets and so on, in the short term, one could very well see if China were to move forward with opening up the capital account without doing things on the domestic front, you could see an exchange rate depreciation. Uh, it's going to depend um, on how China opens up its capital account and whether China does the right things on the domestic front, or both in finance, uh, but also on the uh, real side of the economy, um, the supply side issues and also the SOEs in particular, um, and on the institutional side. Right now, China's doors are open to foreign capital, but you don't see money gushing in because there isn't the confidence that the institutional framework is in place. So 
investing in a Chinese firm is still uh, a bit of uh, a wild gamble because the corporate governance, the auditing and accounting procedures are not in place. So if China got all of these things right in tandem with capital account opening, I don't think it's obvious that there will be a currency depreciation. But still, just the notion that a relatively closed capital account mm -hmm. with uh, an inefficient financial system that generates low real returns, if you open it up right now, just the diversification reason alone could give you some outflows which would generate depreciation pressures in the very short term. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No other comments? So this gentleman uh, if, uh, here in the center, I, a little further. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. A very interesting discussion. My name is Lawrence Freeman. I work in economic policy for Africa for the last 30 years. And I just wanted to follow up on the moderator's question on the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, you answered the question in terms of the financial side and renminbi. But from my standpoint, this is the best thing that's happened to Africa in building infrastructure and energy and ports, which the West has refused to do. And, and much of the I would not say propaganda, but much of the pushback that comes from Washington has been somewhat disproven by a fellow agency down the road. John Hopkins Carey Institute puts out excellent figures on debt and trade. So my question is, okay, you answered one part, but isn't this going to, if the Belt and Road continues to expand and they're talking 120 countries have contracts, $1 trillion, isn't this going to have a major impact on the physical economy of China? in terms of export and trade. Uh, has this been worked into the figures of this book, of what you're expecting on convergence and other matters that were discussed in the morning? It would seem to me it's going to have a big effect. And I don't see it maybe a slow down, but I don't see it stopping by reading the speeches of Xi Jinping. This is his trademark from 2013. And his last book of speeches indicates this is the direction they're going. So I see this as a big impact as we go into 2049. Mm. Thank you. So our esteemed moderator actually has done a lot of work <laughs> on the Belt and Road Initiative, so maybe we should ask her uh, to answer this. Sure. Um, I think, first of all, your first observation that uh, China is doing what many other countries in the West are not doing. Actually, I'm right now writing a comparison of Japan-China. Because Japan, as much as I said that Japan did not get finance right and it cost it dearly, Japan has been very active for decades on infrastructure finance. And uh, in Africa, of course, it's very active, but in Southeast Asia in particular. And um, I've struggled with finding uh, really solid figures, but uh, putting together different sources, you can see that Japan is not a legacy power. It's not just riding on its past glory, but actually is putting investments as of today. And you can see that you could describe this as more uh, of competition, but a constructive competition in the sense that having uh, China making these Belt and Road push then uh, uh, compel Japan to up its game and offer uh, something called qualitative infrastructure with more resources, greater tolerance to risk, and some reforms to the way in which its credit dispersing agencies uh, operate. So I think that uh, it's still very much at play, and it's the kind of competition that we should be uh, encouraging. As to how it will affect China's domestic economy, that I leave to the uh, uh, panelists here. <laughs> Well, I certainly think it's a very important part of the story going forward. I don't remember that we explicitly measured the particular amount of benefit from this Belt and Road Initiative, but I think you look at this from two perspectives. Number one, the reason why China started this Belt and Road Initiative Apart from the international uh, purpose, helping the Africans and so on, there was also a big story about how is, going to, is, is China going to sustain growth going forward, especially external economic cooperation. If you look at the last 40 years, China, you could say China was one of the main beneficiaries of globalization. Our trade and investment, the direct investment, mainly with the developed world, we export to the developed markets and the developed countries um, invest a lot into the Chinese economy. That was one big part of the globalization story. But we certainly do see some kind of a change in the structure of the global economy and a comparative advantage 
of the Chinese economy are opening and developing new areas for international cooperation would also be a very important part of the Chinese story. So working with the Middle East, Africa, um, South Asia, and so on, there are lots of new opportunities coming out, not just like a trade cooperation, but also investment. So I thought that was a very important uh, part, of, part of the story. And in terms of the modeling work, that was, um, was, was embedded in the assumption that uh, continuous opening would be key, and the Belt and Road Initiative would be an, one of the important factors. All right, other questions? Um, um, here, let's go to the back. <coughs> uh, there's a lady in the back. Dr. Hong, I just wanted to ask you what you thought um, might be the structural challenges that foreign investment firms might face as they enter China, such as like culture or volatility and risk in the markets. Um, what do you mean by structural fact uh, risk? Sorry, I think structural is just like a, a random adjective I chose, but just in general, the challenges um, that they might face. Okay, well, certainly um, we, I mean, as I said, FDI into China was one of the very important factors that contributed to the Chinese economic success during the past decades. Um, you probably heard some stories about the complaints by foreign companies um, at the moment in China. And I think these, some of these issues we needed to look at very closely protection of intellectual property rights and the opening of the domestic market and so on, whether or not we can really provide national treatment, I think that's a one big story. But I also want to, um, to, 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 to alert you, uh, bring your attention to some of the changing environment in the domestic economy that might make uh, the foreign companies' fee feelings different. Number one, for instance, the costs are really rising very quickly. So some of the foreign companies in China did pretty well before and are now under pressure, uh, competition pressure. And like the Chinese companies, a lot of companies closing their shop and going somewhere. That's one thing I think foreign companies also feel. Number two, at the very beginning of the reform, the government provided lots of preferential policy treatment. That, I think, is gradually going away because national treatment under the WTO means, really means equal treatment, not means the preferential policies always for the foreign companies. In fact, we had so much complaints from domestic companies why the government are offering all these preferential policies for foreign companies, not us. That at the beginning, it's understandable because we want to provide a confidence incentive for them to come. But after a while, uh, that, that doesn't make, make sense. The third thing I think is related to intellectual property rights, which is very important. Uh, we need to protect better. But one of the reasons why this is becoming a big issue today, I mean, I, I would say protection of intellectual property rights 30 years ago is probably worse than it is today. But why people didn't complain then and now people complaining? One of the key reasons is because the technological gap between domestic and foreign companies narrowing so quickly. So for instance, the Volkswagen, when they first moved to China to produce, they transferred their technology to the local partners. They didn't have any concern at all. The reason was the model Santana, which was used to be very popular and probably accounted for 80% of the Chinese auto market. Because that model they transferred to China, they already stopped producing anywhere in the world. So that is already phased out the model and they took it to China and made a fortune. So they didn't have any concern. But now the market is so upgraded and the local company is really very competitive. That becomes an issue. So I do agree that we need to protect the intellectual property rights better. But for foreign investors, you also need to realize nowadays you get into China, it's not like just like a country that, that it was 40 years ago. It's a high middle income country. We actually have a lot of companies that could actually be at the fourth, uh, a cutting edge front of the technology. So there are lots of things you need to try to, 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 to accommodate. The environment is a change, but I'm not going to get into 
cultural issue and the policy issue. These are the issues that you always have to pay attention to. Good. I would like to go to the front of the room. Uh, this gentleman, please. Uh, Nick Lardy, Peterson, I, I want to ask Yiping, what are the constraints uh, on fintech and uh, the new, the MyBank, WeBank, uh, what are the constraints on them playing an even greater role mm. in the provision of credit to private companies? Because you mentioned they're playing a big role, but yes. uh, there's still a lot of problems for the private sector getting credit. Mm. Well, specifically for these uh, on, new online banks, they got the licenses. Their main constraint at the moment is uh, our regulators still do not allow remote opening of the bank account. So which really means you, they, you can't take deposits. Uh, because all these online banks, they don't have branches um, around the country. They only have one office. The My Bank only is based in Hangzhou. In one office, have a little bit over 1,000 staff. And they're extending more than 10 million loans every year. Um, so that's a big job. But they just don't have the facility to um, have a face-to-face -face signing of the signature and open the bank account. This is why the funding cost for them is much higher than the other banks. I think they would dream for this allowance of the opening of the bank accounts just online. Uh, but it looks like there are some security concerns and uh, I don't feel that the regulators is going to, um, to, to open up. So, so that's one very big uh, um, area um, of concern. For the fintech as a whole, um, I think we are seeing um, very significant progress in many areas. They are leading the world. But um, the, the regulations really need to catch up. So in some areas, I mean, we used to say one of the reasons why the fintech industry is doing so well in China is what we call tolerant regulatory attitude, which means the regulators just look around and see well, what you're doing and maybe it looks like interesting and let you do it. Um, so on the positive side, it was good. Alibaba can play around with Alipay and play around with many of the new financial products and we're all benefiting from it. The, the negative side is Sometimes you allow very weird things to come out and peer-to-peer -peer lending is a one interesting story. And now it's collapsing. Um, I think the regulators didn't really do a good job. If you already know these models would not work, you should go out early and to stop some of the businesses, but that's not happening. So I think innovation, spontaneous innovation is happening and it's a very, very exciting area. I um, actually was talking to David and I, we hope the next project, the joint project, will be on the FinTech develop a revolution in China. But the regulation needs, really need to keep pace with um, the development. Thank you. So I would like to take uh, two more questions and uh, after that together and then I'll also uh, leave some minutes aside in case the panelists would like to make some final comments mm. before we wrap up. So this gentleman and uh, this lady, please. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm still Tom Orlick, and I'm still from Bloomberg. Um, so um, a question for, question for Professor Huang, uh, and perhaps Professor Prasad will also have views on it. Um, so um, over, over the holidays, um, we had the People's Bank of China um, making an announcement that they were transitioning from the benchmark loan rate to the loan prime rate um, as the kind of the anchor for monetary policy. Um, so I have two questions. Um, firstly, how should we interpret the significance of this? Is this the kind of the completion of the PBOC's long transition to a market-based interest rate system? Uh, does it give them significantly more control, more flexibility, or is there still a lot to do? Um, and then the second, more immediate question is, is this immediately gonna going to trigger a drop in the <coughs> cost of credit um, for China's corporate sector? Um, or do you expect loans to re be repriced based on the prime rate, but at, with an unchanged, uh, with an unchanged uh, interest rate? Thank you. So let me take one more question before I ask the okay. panelists to respond. Thank you. Uh, si Yang, reporter from Voice America. Uh, I know we're talking about long-term trends here, but I have a question about what is happening now. So China and the U.S. is going to sign the phase one trade deal. So my question is whether that will help end 
the uh, uh, the trade war or and what, prof what, what Mr. Petri mentioned, the, the decoupling of the two economies. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me go to the panelists who would like to answer those questions. Uh, let me say, it's, it's wonderful to have a phase one trade agreement. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't solve all the problems. I mean, it is, it is a way of, of, I think, putting behind us what was uh, uh, a very kind of, uh, frighteningly uh, escalating uh, relationship between the two countries. So I think let's hope that from here on uh, uh, more cool relationships uh, uh, take hold. But, but it, it, many of the problems are pretty fundamental and they will not go away very quickly. I just wanted to uh, end at the same time on, on the note that we are beginning to realize the limits, uh, particularly to ideology, but, but also to kind of quick, uh, impulsive reactions to problems that may be very real. I mean, for example, I think there are real issues in technological competition, but the initial set of reactions uh, has, been, uh, has, has not been constructed. And I just wanted to mention one, which is I've, I've sort of looked at how the company Huawei has fared in 5G markets around the world. And you can actually find something like 30 countries having had uh, made their positions clear already in one way or another of what they would do. And of those 30, about two thirds have basically said that they will continue to work with Huawei, in some cases in a more limited way than they did before. At the same time, the United States has begun to build, and that's the remaining one third, a uh, group of countries that will want to exclude Huawei from, from. but you know, it, it gives you a sense of how complicated this world is and my guess is that the, that the initial policymakers, as they entered into this policy, didn't, didn't anticipate that. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're, we're kind of maturing into this second, more complicated phase of, of the relationship where we have to uh, take into account how markets react and, and what is ultimately in the long run uh, to the advantage of both countries. Well, I very much um, agree um, to what uh, Peter just said. Um, I would regard this uh, signing of the phase one agreement as the end of the beginning. I think we are in for a very long uh, ride um, about the uh, uh, disagreement. So that's why um, I think it's way, way too early to make a concluding assessment on the decoupling um, thesis. I think this will go on for a very long, term, long time. But I, I, I am very happy about the signing of the phase one agreement. I think the greatest contribution that this agreement might make is to cap the rising policy uncertainty between the two countries. There will still be more discussions, but my own assessment is policy uncertainties are much, much more damaging than tariffs on economic activities. This talks and agreement would certainly uh, be uh, reassuring to the market and the investors, I hope, in the short term. On the interest rate, uh, um, um, I feel that uh, liberalization of the interest rate, I mean, we probably still uh, are quite away from the end of this process. Uh, PPOC certainly is pushing uh, quite, uh, uh, quite, quite, quite heavily on liberalization of the uh, interest rate. One of the critical issues we're still facing at the moment, in addition to um, the setting of the LPRs, the prime rate, and so on, is how or whether or not the banks could actually pricing um, the credit and the, the money uh, according to um, the, the market risks. That's something we still have, uh, have, have, uh, have some gaps in it, and that's what we call the transmi uh, transmission mechanism still needs to be improved. So I think it will take a bit longer before we see the end of this uh, uh, process. In the very near term, and I agree with you, probably this uh, would lead to somewhat downward movement of the cost of capital. That's been one of the policy goals um, uh, promoted by the state council, the PBOC, and so on, particularly because the economy is facing still some downward pressure. So I think some what we call the counter-cyclical monetary policy adjustment is understandable and expected. I just don't expect PBOC to very aggressively to ease the monetary policy in the coming year. <laughs>
Thank you. And I would like to ask the panelists, uh, going in the opposite direction from where we started, if you have anything uh, that you would like to add before we close? So as where the, or Professor Petri and then Professor Wang. So um, tying into um, Mr. Orlik's, uh, you know, slightly wonky question, I think the important thing to recognize is that China is sort of stumbling its way towards getting finance right. Now, the difficulty in China is that even if the financial regulators know what needs to be done and want to improve the system, the fact that you don't have, as uh, Professor Huang correctly alluded to earlier, reforms in the real side of the economy and the institutional um, aspects creates enormous risks in the reform process itself. So I think over the next two or three decades, we're going to see this very herky-jerky sort of uh, approach where uh, there is reform. Um, and there has been very... Uh, modest, but at least uh, uh, some reform on the financial sector, on the capital account, capital market issues more broadly. But many of these have created uh, negative uh, repercussions. Um, the August 11, 2015 move ostensibly towards a more flexible exchange rate regime was done without the right institutional context, which so sort of blew up in the PBOC's face. So I think we will continue seeing these accidents, but the intentions of the authorities, I think, are what are interesting to observe. They seem very committed, at least to one aspect of reform. Whether they will balance this out with reforms on the other side is the real issue. Um, if that happens, I think China can look to a more prosperous uh, um, future. If not, um, China might still have a prosperous future, but it's going to involve a lot more accidents along the way and could make the path to 2049 uh, a lot more interesting. On the minor point about uh, um, the phase one deal, let me remind everyone that uh, there are still five days left. That's about 120 hours worth of tweets that could still uh, change <laughs> things. But the important thing to realize is what Professor Huang again suggested, that even if we do get a de-escalation, um, the fundamental uh, economic and trade tensions between the two countries have, I think, um, crossed a certain threshold where it's going to be very difficult to pull them back. So if you think about the negative effects um, <coughs> on the two countries, especially in terms of investment, and private investment in China, as uh, um, Nick Lardy has shown, is not doing very well. Um, in the US, investment is contracting. And that fundamental source of uncertainty, I think, is uh, here with us to stay for a while. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Petri? I have little, little to add. I th I, the, the words that I'm thinking about is uh, misunderstanding and transparency. I think there is, there, we, we have a chance now, I think, for a period in which some of these fundamental, uh, fundamental misunderstandings can be eased. Yeah. I will say a few words about the report as a whole. Um, the report itself looks at the next three decades. And uh, one key takeaway, if you like, is that it will be different from the last four decades. So, there will be a lot of new challenges, higher income, which means higher cost um, for inno need for innovation, demographic <coughs> change, and also very different external environment. Our forecast, however, as you can see, uh, shows that uh, gro GDP growth rate probably would moderate to between 2.7% to 4.4% by 2049. Um, some people feel that that's very pessimistic because we are talking about this year whether or not we can maintain 6%. But I can tell you by 2049, these numbers are actually results of a more optimistic uh, um, uh, forecast because by then we will be a relatively advanced economy. Our GDP per capita will be much, much higher than it is um, today. But there are a lot of challenges we need to overcome, and I'm not going to get into the detail. Just to summarize one message, I think China was successful during the last 40 years. There were many factors that contributed to it. But the two most important factors, number one, reform domestically. Number two, opening externally. I think if we continue to do these two, we will be there by 2049 to the numbers we predicted in the book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.